Welcome to COS 107, Problem Solving Logic and Design. My name is uh, Dr. Jens Hanneman. I'll be the instructor for your course. And uh, again, this uh, course serves as the introduction to um, computer science and computer programming in general at the uh, Kentucky State University. So let me tell you a little bit uh, about myself. I uh, um, have a PhD in electrical engineering, so I'm actually not a uh, computer scientist uh, from the University of Kiel in Germany. So I'm from Germany originally, have been uh, in Kentucky for 11 years, spent uh, 10 years at the University of Kentucky as a uh, postdoc, uh, research professor, adjunct professor, and uh, for one year now I've been with uh, Kentucky State University. So um, my uh, research is in the area of um, wave propagation and simulation, um, most notably um, microwaves, electromagnetic waves, antennas, and uh, these days uh, mainly audio signal processing, three-dimensional audio. And um, so I have fairly extensive experience in building large software systems that run on large computers, so uh, high-performance computing is uh, my thing. And I hope that the uh, experience that uh, I've had in that field um, hopefully directly translates into uh, me being able to um, show you a couple of things and uh, uh, especially introduce you to uh, modern um, large-scale software design with an introduction and uh, to uh, the programming language Python. So let's uh, have a look at the uh, class objectives. Um, this uh, course mainly is an introduction to program design, so that's what we'll be having our emphasis on. Um, however, at some point, of course, a design must be implemented on a computer, and we are going to use the Python programming language for that, which is a very nice um, object-oriented programming language that uh, is um, pretty elegant and uh, yet uh, very powerful. As a matter of fact, Google is probably the largest Python installation in the world. So uh, again, however, and I've mentioned this before already, um, this course is a little bit unusual in its approach uh, in the sense that uh, typically introductory courses to programming um, heavily focus on algorithms. However, that's not how modern large-scale systems are being designed. And uh, that's actually also not how modern software libraries are even designed. So um, I intend to uh, introduce object orientation as early as possible to you. And uh, one hallmark of object-oriented design really is that it is data-centric rather than algorithm-centric. It uh, uses a lot of um, abstraction by analyzing um, um, relationships between uh, objects and uh, putting them in uh, hierarchies. And so that's what uh, I'll be trying to do with this course. Again, a little bit unusual, but uh, I hope that it will certainly benefit your future studies because you'll be able much, much earlier in your student career uh, to use modern object-oriented libraries to uh, achieve more complex goals. So. Um, um, the one thing that I do want to stress that there is a distinct difference between programming and uh, computer science. Uh, there is uh, a relationship, certainly, but uh, um, this quote probably um, catches its best uh, when uh, Edska Dijkstra um, says that computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. Uh, this is uh, certainly true. I mean, I have a very good friend who is the director of the Student Observatory at the University of Kentucky. And uh, he, of course, knows a whole lot about telescopes. However, that's not the main point of astronomy. Astronomers use telescopes to look at faraway objects to figure out how the universe is uh, um, made up. So <clears throat> in that respect, uh, um, programming languages and programming in, in general is, again, a tool that computer scientists use However, the main point of computer science really is to process information or store and retrieve it efficiently. Um, and uh, to that, 
means the computer is to that end the computer is just the uh, means and programming is just the method that they uh, used to do it uh, as a matter of fact Edgar Dijkstra himself um, is uh, uh, was one of the last great computer scientists who never ever even owned a computer funny enough the quote is actually wrongly attributed to uh, Dijkstra who probably uh, most likely never said it um, but uh, the original quote is usually attributed to Michael Fellows I've put the name Ian Parberry here because I met him at a conference uh, a couple of weeks ago in Louisville, though, and uh, it seems to be that the um, um, expression has been uh, uh, floating around a conference that they all attended. So it was um, common folklore knowledge at that uh, uh, time, and uh, uh, somebody, since Dexter probably was the, the most um, uh, visible person on, on that uh, eventually attributed it to Dijkstra. So that's why there are uh, three names, there are probably uh, many more. But uh, again, the, the quote is really capturing the essence of the relationship between computer science and uh, programming. So in other words, uh, um, every computer scientist uh, um, should be able to be a programmer, uh, whereas not every programmer by default will automatically be a computer scientist. So um, to give you an illustration on uh, a little bit more detail with what I mean by that, let me, let me tell you the story of Karl Friedrich Gauss. He was a German mathematician in the uh, 19th century, and uh, many regard him as one of the greatest uh, mathematicians uh, ever. And uh, as a matter of fact, as you can see from the picture, the uh, uh, Germany uh, this is a, a German 10 mark uh, bill before it was being replaced by the uh, euro. Um, thought that uh, Gauss was so great that they put him, uh, and as if you look closely, the uh, standard, uh, the normal distribution uh, on uh, their currency. So he was very smart. Oh, by the way, and if you notice um, up here in the, uh, the top of the slide, there's a uh, um, something blue with this uh, when you download the uh, uh, PDFs for the slides this is a link so uh, that link will bring you directly to the um, Wikipedia page for Gauss and uh, so you can find this throughout my slides uh, where there's something interesting to elaborate further on uh, feel free to uh, click away and uh, um, try to um, uh, deepen your knowledge on that. Gauss was very smart as a kid um, not only as an adult, and uh, he, uh, as many smart kids do, get, got bored in elementary school, and of course he misbehaved. And at one point his teacher just had it, and so he told, was told by the teacher to just go sit in a corner and to add up all numbers from 1 to 100. And uh, he produced the correct answer within seconds without even sitting down. And the teacher was flabbergasted on how he did it, and I'm going to show you how he did it. Um, Point is that uh, Gauss, like many humans actually are, uh, or humans in general, are good at detecting patterns. And he detected a, a particular pattern that allowed him to uh, basically bypass all the work uh, by, by smartly exploiting that pattern. And this is really what um, the life of a computer scientist uh, actually looks like. Um, computer scientists usually spend really not all that much of their time writing code or programming computers but rather trying to detect patterns, most notably um, uh, try to map those patterns that they detect to solve a given problem um, and to try to map that to uh, a pattern that's already known or if there's uh, no known pattern that they can use to solve this problem then they will of course think long and hard to try to uh, come up with new ways of solving this and exploiting the properties of that pattern. So what was the pattern that Gauss noted? Let's uh, have a look. So Gauss noted that, uh, well, if uh, I write up the numbers in a particular way, then uh, something happens. But uh, here again is the uh, overall problem that he was given. And uh, if you do this manually and uh, go from left to right, of course, the whole thing will be a fairly tedious process. Um, and by the way, if you've uh, never seen this here, uh, this is just the uh, shorthand notation for what's on the right. And the uh, symbol you see there is a capital Greek letter called sigma to signify the sum. And by the way, the uh, whole 
problem here that you see here is actually called the arithmetic series in mathematics, but uh, that's just besides the point. So Gauss noted, however, when I take 1 and 100, that I end up with a 101. Um, also, if I take 2 and 99, I also do get a 101. And so on, I always get a 101. And uh, he then just asked himself, well, how many of these do I have? Well, it turns out that uh, he exactly has 50 of them. So, in order to solve this for any number n, uh, of course for 50, the whole thing then is 50 um, times 101, which is uh, 5050. And if you extend this to any number n, uh, then you'll see that this is actually n times n plus 1 half. Um, so, uh, and uh, that's exactly what's down here. So, instead of um, computing and slogging through the uh, uh, actual additions, and as you uh, see, there are actually 99 of those additions. Um, all he had to do uh, to solve the problem was to use uh, one addition, that's right here, one multiplication and one division, and that allowed him to solve the problem much, much faster. So he had three operations rather than 99 operations, but not only this, that actually gets better than that. So, uh, but let's uh, have a look at this uh, first because computer scientists, of course, has, have formalized this kind of thing. Uh, this is actually what we call computational complexity. You, uh, in order to solve a problem, just count the number of operations uh, as a function of uh, the problem size n. You just leave out the uh, nitty gritty details uh, and uh, come up with something what's called the big O notation. And uh, so, uh, where big O actually stands for in the order of. So, the brute force approach uh, really requires, as we already said, 99 additions for n equal 100. However, uh, if you uh, increase n to 1000, so 10 times as much, it takes roughly 10 times amount the work. So, in general, for, for any n, it requires n minus n additions, and this is being specified in big O notation as being saying O of n, and we call this linear complexity. So, uh, in other words, again, if I uh, double the size of a problem, I roughly double the size of the work I have to do. However, with uh, Gauss, it gets much better, because um, regardless of the number n, really all it takes are three operations, one addition, one multiplication, one division, and that's independent of the actual value of n. So we call this constant complexity, and actually, uh, because it really doesn't matter what particular number this is, we call this O of 1. Um, so this is really as, as good as it gets, you can't do any better. And this is um, really a solution that is the optimal way of, of solving this, which is much, much faster. Although on computers, again, addition um, uh, can be done usually in one clock cycle, whereas multiplication and division take a little bit longer, but the important point is it's still independent of the value. So the amount of work a computer has to do to compute this really is constant. So and uh, this really nicely illustrates the difference between programming and uh, uh, computer science. So if you're just a programmer you tend to use brute force. Computer scientists uh, on the other hand will try to analyze the complexity and minimize it. However there is a middle ground and that's really where effective and efficient solutions come in. So good computer scientists really um, check whether they can uh, get away with using brute force, and uh, if not, then then only then they start to reduce complexity. So this is really ultimately um, uh, signified in the uh, uh, Unix philosophy. Unix, the uh, operating system that Ken Thompson designed in the 70s, and that is the foundation these days, uh, of course, of uh, uh, macOS and, uh, uh, of course, Linux itself as well. So, and uh, if you click on the link, you get a little bit more information about the philosophy in general, but the most important one in this particular context is really uh, to say, when in doubt, use brute force, and that really is the shorthand notation for what I just said, that um, Go for brute force first because that's a simple solution that you can program fast as well, especially in an efficient language like uh, Python. 
and uh, then analyze where the bottlenecks are and go ahead and try to optimize that. And there are tools for that and we'll introduce you over the uh, course of your study to uh, many of these tools to actually do this. So again, when in doubt, use brute force. So let's look at an actual Python program that uh, demonstrates the uh, brute force method versus uh, what Gauss did. So uh, Python is a fairly complete language. So the only thing we have to really, in this particular case, um, import from an external module that's not part of the language itself uh, really is uh, a mechanism to just measure time because you of course want to figure out how long each portion of the program takes. So uh, that's what the first line here really says. We want to uh, uh, import everything from a module called date time, date time. and uh, this uh, is it. And then before we start doing this uh, over and over again we can uh, uh, so we want to actually ask the user a couple of times for a couple of numbers so that we can enter different numbers to see and play with the program uh, how long it actually takes. So um, for uh, uh, we ask the um, user for an initial number which is done here with the input and of course the message behind that is the um, prompt that the user sees and uh, then the user can enter any number and let's say it is a hundred. Uh, what the uh, um, computer will return at that point to uh, Python, however, is not an actual number in the sense of that the computer can um, work with it, uh, but it's just a, a string of characters. It's a string of the characters 1, 0, and 0, and uh, the computer needs to convert this to an actual number before it can do actual arithmetic actual arithmetic with it and this is what the int does here it takes the string and converts it to an actual number and uh, then uh, assigns that number to a variable that we call number so um, then we start uh, entering a loop we're saying we want to execute uh, what's next while the number being entered is not zero this is uh, what's signified here and then we have a colon and then you'll notice that the um, contents after that is actually indented. This is different from uh, um, almost any other programming language that indentation in Python is significant. It really um, tells the uh, Python interpreter uh, that uh, when it sees a different level of indentation that uh, something in this case is part of a uh, loop and that it's uh, going to be executed up to the point until the indentation goes back to uh, the uh, very left at which point the loop is over and uh, program execution resumes as normal. So this is uh, significant in Python in many other programming languages you would actually use braces or special keywords to signify this uh, and this is one of the reasons why Python tends to be a uh, very elegant and very readable language because additional elements are really kept to a minimum. So then we just print uh, again another uh, quick message to tell the user what's uh, going on and uh, we uh, just initialize a variable that will hold our result to zero. We uh, ask the computer for uh, the uh, current time and then uh, uh, store that time in a variable named start and then we execute another loop within the loop so these things obviously can be nested as you can see here where we say we want to iterate over a range of numbers starting from uh, 1 and uh, going to a 101 the 101 here uh, if number contains 100 uh, the uh, uh, number plus 1 here is uh, significant because the range that is being produced um, does not include the last number for various reasons that you'll see later on when you learn a little bit more about Python. Um, however, so uh, we want to produce numbers in the range from 1 to 100 and that's why we have to give it uh, the range of 1 to 101. And uh, uh, for each iteration that uh, uh, value is stored in another index variable, hence the i here, uh, you can name it any way you want, but i is a very very common use for that name. And uh, then we just uh, take the uh, uh, current result, which at the beginning of the loop is 0, uh, we add i to it, which is at the beginning is 1, and then we uh, reassign it to the result. So after the first iteration, this will uh, contain the value 1, and the next iteration, uh, the result will uh, 
be 1, the actual uh, i will be 2, so we compute 1 plus 2, and, uh, which will be 3. In the next iteration, you have uh, uh, 3 plus 2, which is 5, and so on, and so on, and so on. So um, then, uh, ultimately, when we're done, again, note the indentation here. Um, when we are done with that, uh, ultimately, the uh, um, um, current time is being taken again, assigned to a variable named stop. And we use this here to actually um, compute the difference, convert that into seconds, because this is usually um, uh, expressed in uh, something that the uh, CPU directly understands. It's mostly something like uh, nanoseconds actually directly tied to the CPU um, clock. But uh, in any case, the whole thing then is converted to a string so that we as humans can understand it, <clears throat> and it will ultimately be printed to the screen. So that's the um, uh, way to express the uh, brute force method in Python. Uh, however, we keep going, and uh, uh, now we'll, in the next slide, uh, execute the uh, Gauss method. So here's Gauss. Uh, we start off by uh, setting result back to uh, zero. And again, we uh, go ahead and take the time, and uh, then the uh, um, result is being computed directly, so there is no loop or anything like that. And here is the representation of the formula you saw on the screen. So uh, we take the number, uh, we uh, add 1, we multiply it, and then we divide it by 2. Uh, what you see here is actually uh, the request of an integer division. We're going to talk a little bit this. Uh, a little bit more about this when we talk about integers, floating points, all the different data types, the numeric data types that we have here. But suffice it to say that this uh, makes the computation much, much faster. Uh, and uh, this always works, by the way, because a number times number plus one always is an even number. So the reminder of that division always is zero. So that works out just fine. We again take the uh, stop, print the results, and down here, as you can see, the uh, indentation stops. So that tells the uh, interpreter that the loop is over. Before we um, uh, go back to the beginning of the loop, we uh, request new input from the uh, user. And if the user at this point uh, would enter a zero, we would end up at the uh, beginning of the loop. And the loop would say, uh, OK, um, zero is. Uh, um, the condition to actually stop the execution of the loop, and we are back at the very last um, um, part of the program here, where we just uh, printed a little thank you note inspired by Douglas Adams. Um, and uh, that uh, is the overall program. You can download this from the uh, uh, Blackboard uh, site and uh, execute it in your uh, Python interpreter. And uh, as a matter of fact, the next module uh, will show you interactively how to uh, get um, Python onto your machine uh, if you don't already have it, uh, and uh, how to start with the Python interpreter and how to use that. So um, but that's the Python program. Now let's uh, see what happens when we run it. So running the program, that's uh, what happened here. I started up the Python interpreter, and uh, the first number to enter is the original 100 from uh, Gauss. And uh, we see that the result in both cases is, uh, of course, 5050, and that it both took uh, both algorithms about the same time. This is about um, 300 milliseconds or 150 milliseconds. <coughs> so the, um, in this case, the difference is not all that much, although, of course, the Gauss method still is faster. Uh, that becomes significant in light of the Unix philosophy. On the other hand, however, when I increase the number significantly, um, interesting things happen and the difference starts to grow rapidly. So uh, this is, uh, I believe, 10 million. So uh, the brute force method at that point, even on a fast computer, takes about 1.5 seconds. Whereas, um, however, uh, the um, computation for the uh, um, Gauss method uh, stays the same uh, or actually has even decreased. This is uh, um, basically eight microseconds. And um, so, uh, and what you see here actually is that the uh, times, even for the same algorithm, really is not necessarily constant because we have uh, a multitasking computer. So, computers 
uh, do something else in between while they're not uh, not busy or even if they are busy they are interrupted by other things going on uh, and also you'll see that uh, uh, typically the first time a program runs uh, it runs a little bit slower because um, other things have to happen in the background uh, memory has to be filled this kind of stuff and uh, for the second run you really don't need that that's why the second run usually is faster than the first one which you see here but uh, in any case, uh, the uh, uh, results, uh, I believe, are uh, quite obvious that indeed for Gauss, just a, uh, the same um, regardless of the size of the number that you put in, whereas uh, the larger the number you input for the brute force method, uh, the more you have to work for it to uh, get the same result. So and this really um, um, signifies quite uh, or illustrates quite nicely what's uh, going on here, what we mean by a linear and uh, um, constant computational complexity. So again, we've seen uh, as n increases, so does our brute force computation time, um, and that uh, uh, Gauss is uh, constant. However, of course, for uh, n equals 100, we see that uh, really there are about the same, not the same order of magnitude, and this is really where the Unix philosophy comes in. Uh, so uh, you would use brute force in the first iteration of a uh, design process, and uh, if uh, it turns out that that is not efficient or fast enough to accomplish a goal, you go back, uh, uh, examine what uh, and where exactly the problem is, and uh, try to uh, optimize that. And the optimization can be to re-implement parts of that in a faster um, programming language like C or C++. It can be using a different algorithm like Gauss over brute force, and so on and so on. But this really is what uh, um, most of your time in, uh, as a computer scientist is being spent on. So, in summary, I hope I showed you that computer science is actually largely not about computers. Uh, that, however, you still need to know about computers and that a little thinking gives you a long way. And uh, that the uh, Unix philosophy really is a, a good guideline here. Um, and uh, let me close this module with uh, a uh, quote from uh, Will Wheaton, and if you click on the link, it brings you to a very nice YouTube video um, that um, really summarizes his experiences as a uh, nerd and geek, and uh, to some degree, many computer scientists are. Uh, sometimes we uh, suffer from it, sometimes not, um, but ultimately we uh, must make our peace with it, and this is really um, a nice summary that uh, I hope uh, inspires you a little bit as you go on in uh, learning more about computer science and becoming a computer scientist. And uh, again, uh, be honest, be kind, be honorable, work hard, there will be no shortage of that, and always be awesome because being a nerd and a geek is awesome.